Good morning. This is Heather again. Thank you so much for joining us. Just a few things before we get started. We'll be muting everyone's phone line during the presentation to cut down on background noise. Also, if you have any questions for our panelists today, you can go ahead and submit them in the question panel, and we'll, come, we'll get to them in the Q&A session at the end. Welcome to the second webinar in our two-part series on delivering an identity and context service featuring Radiant Logic's L. Griffin and Career Coal Analyst Dave Kern. In today's session, Dave will look at how to define context as it relates to identity and will show how attributes and their relationships can yield new insight about a person or an entity. L will then explain how to link identity to context, how to build sentences using attributes, and finally give a short demonstration of Radiant's context browser. Okay, let's get started with Dave Kern. Dave? Thank you, Heather. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you happen to be and whatever time of day it happens to be for you. As Heather mentioned, this is a continuation of a seminar we did uh, some weeks ago about context. And you, if you want, can find uh, replays of that webinar by both the uh, Radiant Logic website and the Coopinger Cole website. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Coopinger Coal, uh, they are perhaps the leading European consultants on identity and uh, cloud computing. Uh, I recently joined the organization, although uh, I had worked with them for a number of years on various projects. If you go out to coopingercoal.com, you can find out a whole lot more about the organization and, and what we do. Uh, primarily in the spring we deliver the European Identity and Cloud Conference. This year it will be in April in Munich. It's a conference that I've uh, presented at over the last five years and I believe Radiant Logic has been there each of those years too. Uh, it is by far the biggest and best identity conference that you'll find in Europe. Uh, again, you can go out to the website and find out more about that. Today's agenda uh, as Heather mentioned, I'll be talking about um, what context means to identity or putting identity in context. Then Al Griffin from Radiant Logic will tell us about delivering context as a service, and we will have a Q&A at the end uh, as time permits. As background, though, I think when we're talking about putting identity into context or context services, we really need to have some sort of agreement on what we mean by context so that we know what we're talking about, especially when we realize that context is defined as the part of a text or state statement that surrounds a particular word or passage and determines its meaning. So it's somewhat ironic then that we have to determine the meaning of context before we can do this. Uh, context we're going to use this way, this is called the denotation of the word. This is the dictionary meaning of the word. The contextual meaning of a word is what we talk about when we put that word into context. And I want to give you an example to show you how the context can change the meaning. Okay? We'll take a simple word, drew, four letters, usually used as a verb, sometimes a noun, uh, a proper noun, someone's name. But as a verb, it can have multiple meanings. Simply to say Dave drew really doesn't nail down what it is we mean. So let's look at some possibilities by surrounding Drew with some other words. We could say Dave drew a straight. Now any poker players or other card players out there should immediately recognize what this context is and they should be able to visualize what this sentence means when we say Dave drew a straight. We mean that he took cards from the dealer and they gave him a sequence uh, of cards without any gaps. In this case, ace, king, queen, jack, and ten. Uh, it could also be two, three, four, five, and six, but it looks better when you have the court cards in there. Uh, Dave drew a straight. It's unambiguous. We know what it means. But suppose we add some words. Dave drew a straight line. Now we're no longer talking about cards, are we? We're talking about a infinite series of points that are connected. And not only that, we're talking about an infinite series of points which, once they're extended infinitely, will never cross themselves. It's a straight line, a 180-degree angle, if you will. Uh, again, 
once we look at the words surrounding Drew, we know the exact context, we know the exact meaning, we know what it is that we're talking about. But let's put another couple of words in there and see if perhaps we can change the meaning again. Dave drew a straight line from the shell. Now we're not talking about a series of connected points or even a series of connected cards. We're talking here in terms of a comedy duo. There aren't very many comedy duos anymore, but if you'll remember those such as, say, Cheech and Chong or Martin and Lewis or Rowan and Martin, one of the two is usually the so-called straight man who would deliver the straight line, as Michelle is doing here. Who was that lady I saw you with last night? This would allow the other partner, the comedian, to deliver the punch line. That was no lady, that was my wife. Again, we look at the words surrounding true, and we immediately know what it is that I mean. We look at the context, and we know what's happening. As we said, context, it's the part of a text or statement that surrounds a particular word or passage and determines its meaning. Now let's adapt that definition just a little bit so that it contextually relates to identity a bit more. If we take a few of the words and replace them with some others, we'll find that we could say context is the attributes that surround a particular object and determine its meaning. We've taken word from the original definition and changed that into object. Uh, or we could use it as the word subject. It's what we're talking about, and the attributes are what we're saying about that particular object, which is the subject of our identity sentence here. There are lots of attributes that surround any particular object. We know that. What we're going to see is how we can use those attributes to set a context for the person. Because if we just take all of the attributes that surround an object, and if you think of yourself and, and the attribute value pairs that are associated with you, there's lots that are associated with you personally, with your work, with your relationships with your family and with friends, uh, with your activities outside of the office and outside of the home, huge numbers of attributes that surround you as an object. But if you throw a whole bunch of raw attributes in a bag, someone once said, the end result is just a bag of attributes. There's no meaning involved there. If you can take that handful of attributes and establish a relationship among them, using just those attributes appropriate at this time, then you have an identity context. Andre Durand, who's the CEO of Ping Identity, one of the foremost organizations in federated identity, which will use attributes and context, said that the sum of the correlation between attributes is greater than the sum of the raw attributes themselves. In other words, we take that bag of raw attributes, which is just a bag of attributes, okay, and when we create the correlation or the context, then we have something that is of much more value than the attributes by themselves. That's sort of abstract. Let's see if we can make this just a bit concrete for you. There's a scenario. Here's a uh, a gentleman, we'll call him Bob, okay, who accesses his corporate bank account via his cell phone and using two factors uh, to log in. Uh, the SIM chip itself and a username password combination. So it's two-factor authentication. This is necessary because as we find out from Bob's attributes in his corporate life, uh, he's the chief financial officer. He's allowed to approve up to $5 million in spending or transfer. But someone has set a rule on there that says he has to authenticate via multi-factor or two-factor authentication in order to do so, especially if he's outside the office and if he's on his smartphone, then 
we're going to have to assume he's outside the office, although really in this situation we don't know. He may be sitting in his, in his office and using a smartphone to do this or a tablet or whatever. But because he has authenticated with two-factor, uh, generally speaking, most systems will let him go ahead and, and make the, uh, the transfer that he wants to make. Now, Bob has a number of different digital identities or personas. <coughs> Excuse me. There's Bob, his personal identity, CFO, his corporate identity. Uh, his identity as a spouse, that's family and friends relationship. He's also a, a noted traveler, so he has attributes associated with his traveling. And he's a part-time actor, uh, and he has attributes associated with that. As a person, as Bob, he has a, a date of birth, a driver's license, some bank accounts, some uh, credit cards. These travel with him no matter where he goes. They have really no relationship to his uh, work life. He's also a spouse. He has attributes associated there. He's marital status, his, his spouse's name, Carol their anniversary, their children, and if there were children, there'd be other things associated there, like the names of the children and their birthdays and so on, which is another bag of attributes for Bob. There's his employer's attributes. We know that he works at Bigger is Better Incorporated, that he's the CFO, uh, that uh, Alice is a direct report of his. As a traveler, we know that he is uh, um, frequent flyer with American Airlines, a frequent cruiser with Holland America Line, and he has some current reservations there. And as an actor, uh, we know that his Q score is quite high. This is, this is how audiences perceive him. And he gets a fairly good performance fee. Uh, in reality, Bob could give up being CFO and, and, uh, and become an actor full time if he really wanted to. But these are all silos of identity. Each of those silos only gives us a narrow view of Bob. What we really need to do here is to put Bob into some sort of context. And we remember we do that by creating relationships among the various attributes that Bob has. Because otherwise it's just a big bag of attributes, and it really doesn't tell us anything. As we said, if you can take a handful of attributes, establish a relationship among them, then what you've got is an identity context. So we look at Bob's silos here of attributes, and we see that as Bob, he has a Swiss bank account, as the CFO, he can approve up to $5 million, and there's someone named Alice who reports to him, that he's married, and his wife's name is Carol. As a traveler, he has these reservations, and as an actor, he's quite good and could probably earn a living that way. So what does that tell us about Bob? Well, we want to relate those things. We want to draw the path through those attributes, make the connections, and determine a context for Bob. We also then can flesh out this scenario because we know more about who Bob is. We know that Bob is accessing the corporate bank account from his smartphone using two factors, but we also know that it's 7 o'clock on a Sunday morning that he's in the harbor in Rio de Janeiro, notorious for not uh, extraditing criminals back to the US, and that Alice is also there, not his spouse Carol. This should, of course, raise a lot of red flags to people. And in fact, when we put all of that together, we just might determine that old Bob is an embezzler. He's run off with Alice, and we're never going to see that $5 million again. That's what context can do for you here in the realm of authentication and authorization, which is just one small piece of the 
context picture. But it does tell us that context is critical in the authorization and profile management realm. Without knowing Bob's context when he tried to do that transaction, he would have gotten away with it. He would have his money and his Alice and be footloose and fancy free in Rio. But because we did give it some context, he wasn't able to do that. Now, we've had the tools to determine that context for quite some time. Uh, thanks to Radiant Logic, for example, uh, with their virtualization and, and uh, uh, context services. But up till now, it's mostly been a manual process. We've had to make those connections ourselves. We had to look at the various possibilities of correlations and other relationships to determine what that context is. If only we could virtualize that context and automate the contextualization and deliver it uniformly to our applications and services. If only there was a way to, to allow our systems to handle this context on their own rather than relying on the users to determine that context as they go along. Well, that would mean delivering context as a service through virtualization. Something, as I said, that until recently we haven't been able to do. But, as Elle is about to tell us, it's something we can do now. Elle, tell the people. All right, thanks, Dave. Let me just switch over the presenter here. All right, so Dave gave you some good background on context. So let's talk about context as a service through virtualization. So to start off, let's just review quickly how the dictionary would have defined context. There's essentially two ways to think about it, perception and representation. In perception, context can mean the whole situation, background, or environment relevant to a particular event, personality, or creation. But this is as perceived by humans through our senses and is not applicable to technology quite yet. The second definition, context, means the parts of a sentence, paragraph, or discourse immediately next to or surrounding a specified word or passage to determine its exact meaning. In this case, we're defining context as it is represented through natural language. This is the way that humans exchange information, and as Dave showed us, we're very good at, at interpreting this information with relatively few details. However, computers are still far from being able to understand natural language. But the good news is that data models currently encapsulated within each application already contain all of the crucial contextual data that we need. By representing this data in simple sentences, we can have a clearer understanding of the information that can be understood by both humans and computers. So think about an application as a set of sentences. These sentences can contain various facts that can describe processes such as accounting or billing, CRM, or a marketing application. By tying each set of sentences together, we can view context across applications. So we're already closer to understanding this than we think. A common example would be Google search. In Google, if you type a keyword, it returns a variety of sentences about your given keyword so that you can determine its relevance. So in this example, I did a quick Google search for Kate Spade, my favorite designer, and I received three responses. By looking at the context around Kate Spade, I know if it's more relevant for me to shop for products on her web website, read her bio, or if I just want to look, um, maybe go like her on Facebook. Google is able to provide this capability by indexing all text documents that are published through HTML on the internet. It then allows you to read the snippets on your own so you can discover which items best match what you're searching for. This representation is very efficient when it comes to unstructured text, but it still requires a lot of human in intervention. Unfortunately, our infrastructures are much harder to reach. All of the relevant information within our applications or data silos are buried beneath several layers of protocols and application-specific programming interfaces. We don't yet have the capability to search and organize information across our applications. In order to do this, 
we have to turn our applications into sentences. So here's a quick example. When you and I perceive this picture, we know that it's a picture of shoes. So when I look at these pictures, I know that they're really awesome, gorgeous shoes by my beloved Kate Spade, and that they're probably going to be the best thing ever to wear for New Year's Eve party this year. But the representation of these shoes is not yet comprehensible or actionable by a computer since it's not represented by structured data. We're still decades away from the Jetsons-like world where a computer can perceive things on its own. So how can a computer use context? By qualifying the shoes through text or structured data, a computer can understand a certain amount of information about these shoes. By adding attributes such as price, the type of leather, and even a description that gives possibility for use, a computer now has more robust information about these shoes. This isn't about the physical experience, but the representation of the experience. So let's take a look at an example that one of our customers is currently using in the cable realm. A typical cable company has a variety of data stores that contain vital information about its cable subscribers. There are systems that contain information about the subscriber, such as their name and address and other information. There's a system responsible for upkeep of users' cable boxes. There's a billing and account information in a separate system. And there's a system for logging heat tickets with a support team. When a user calls the call center, the agent is completely swamped with where to look and will have to go to several different data stores to find the information they need. So say a customer's cable goes out and she calls the help desk, the customer service representative will have to look them up by their name in the CRM system, maybe enter a heat ticket in the travel ticket system, open up the billing system to find out who to bill for the service, and then back to the CRM system again to find the address necessary in order to ship the customer a new cable box. So that sounds like a complete disaster. Ultimately, the goal is to aggregate all of the data from these backend sources to create a single view of the information. The customer service rep can then view all of the information relevant to a particular customer without switching through all the different applications and dealing with their individual interfaces and menus. So now, if a customer suddenly discovers that their cable's gone out and calls the call center, a technician can easily search by the customer's name or other attribute and see all of the different attributes related to the complaint without being exposed to all of the backend data sources. Behind the scenes, this is really how it looks. The data is incomprehensible to anyone outside of the individual system administrators or the application developer. So linking these systems together and making them easy to understand is a major challenge that until now has been the exclusive domain of heavy application integration. So now that we've discussed the potential use case, let's talk about how we can achieve it. So at its lowest level, a keyword is the starting point for any search. So for example, Kate Spade. This relates to the attribute qualifier, which is brand. The object or entity that relates to brand, Kate Spade, is a pair of shoes. We can tag a verb to describe the relationship those shoes with, a, with another object, such as belong to, which can then create a complete sentence. Shoes with the brand Kate Spade and sold at the distributor Nordstrom belong to a person whose first name is L. Finally, we arrive at context, which is the linking together of several of these sentences where a subject matches another subject or an object. The best way to organize this information so that it can be understood by a computer is hierarchically. By doing this, we can move from an object-oriented model where the actions and verbs are implicit and hidden in the user interface by form to a sentence-oriented model where objects are represented as sentences through their relationships with other objects. This will allow us to see the activities and other related information that surrounds an individual. Sentences can be understood through human language and can be understood and actionable by a computer. When looking at information hierarchically, you can then create a link between two objects and tag it with a verb. So this creates a set of sentences that can be read subject, verb, object, and so on. So for example, a typical hierarchy could show the various departments and brands that make up Nordstrom's. In this example, by tagging the links between each object with a verb, we can see the complete picture. Nordstrom's has the department shoes, which sells the brand Kate Spade for a price range of between $100 and $300. 
This type of contextual information could be useful by Nordstrom to gather information about a user or customer, or about the product. Knowing attributes such as brand, price, color, and so on could be used to suggest products to a consumer as a personalized service. But this is only one way that this technology could be used. There are several other instances where context could be useful to view in-depth knowledge of objects in sentence form. The more information you have, the more in-depth sentences you could produce. So here's a quick diagram that details how we achieve this. Radiologic's identity service creates a global data model where each of these icons represents a table of structured data. Radiant aggregates all the information from your local data silos, extracts the schema from the data source, and creates a global model where information can be organized hierarchically. Radiant can then link identities to context by regrouping objects into sentences and then sentences into context for a complete view of information. So just to give you an example of how this works, I'm just going to quickly show you a demo of our context browser and see it in action. So in this first scenario, I'm going to assume we're working with a system that virtualized a CRM database, an inventory system, and an ordering system. So if I'm a sales representative, I might want to know which backpacks I've sold, for example. I can type backpack into the search field, which will return several sentences relevant to the keyword. We can see that a map is retrieved in product Conestoga since it's highlighted in red, and that my keyword, backpack, was discovered in the product type description. I can also see all of the context surrounding that item. I can see that product Conestoga was part of order eight, which was placed by Big Mountain Supplies, whose sales representative is Nancy DeVolio. If I want to learn more, I can simply click on one sentence to retrieve the form field, which gives details relevant to the subject and the object. So here I can see that I now have three fields. The context field on top, which shows all the sentences relevant to my search, a sentence field, which shows what I've selected, and a form field that shows attribute details relevant to the subject and object of the sentence. So here I can see information regarding my order and also about the backpack itself. I can also browse around through the different sentences to find out more information. For example, I can click on Nancy DeVolio. And now I can see that she owns multiple accounts and find out more information about those. In a second scenario, I can virtualize information coming from, say, um, a Cisco router and a web server. So if I want to find out who's been using HTTP, I can do a search and uncover sentences once again. So in this case, I can see that Adam Crumble was using YouTube which was transmitted using the HTTP protocol. I can also see that Adam was using Gmail and thus accessing his email through HTTPS. Once again, I can click a sentence to find out more information, all of this coming from either my Cisco router or my web server, and search across them to find information in a more meaningful way. A third example of how I could use context would be to virtualize information about my house. So I can use various GPS-enabled devices and associate them with my house. By doing a search for cell phone, now I can find my cell phone based on its GPS coordinates, which have been associated with rooms in my house. I now know that my phone is located in my living room, and that there's also other cell phone devices located various, in various locations throughout my house. Once again, by clicking a sentence, I can find out more useful information regarding my cell phone and its location. So let's take a look at context, um, our context builder, which is what makes all of this possible. Behind the scenes, we're able to represent various data silos in the form of sentences and search across them. For each system or view, we can link information from different data silos together. So here we can see that by clicking on the data structure, we can link a sales representative to an account and then tag the relationship between the two with a verb such as own, so that we now know that a sales representative owns an account. We can repeat this process so that we also know that account 
refers to a context, account, purchase, and order, and an order is related to a product, and so on. So now, if we run a search in context browser, we can not only find a keyword, but the context surrounding that keyword. By abstracting information that's been captured from different data silos and then representing that information as sentences, we end up with searchable context that allows us to know the context and trigger an intelligent action that could be used for authorization purposes or any other context aware services. So that was our presentation. At this point, we are going to take a few questions from the audience. Okay, thank you all. Um, let's start with a question for Dave. Um, Dave, um, you mentioned that context is important for authorization, uh, but some analysts like Bob Blakely see context also playing a role in authentication, possibly replacing the traditional log on name mechanism. What do you think about this subject? Well, Bob is a distinguished analyst. He's an old friend and also now a competitor. And what he said recently was that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, not only is passwords or usernames obsolete and we should be moving away from them, but he foresees the time when traditional authentication won't be used anymore, will we'll be replaced by what he calls recognition. And he illustrates this by saying it's what happens when you're walking down the street and see someone coming towards you, and you subconsciously at least analyze their face and their hair, uh, their clothing, their mode of dress, the way they move, the way they're walking. Uh, as you get closer, their, their voice and their, their mode of speaking, the words they use, and so forth. And subconsciously, again, you come to a conclusion that this is your friend George. You recognize him. You recognize George. Uh, you don't have to ask him for a driver's license or a passport. Uh, you know that it's George. So that the authentication step is no longer there. Uh, he expects the same sort of thing to be happening digitally. Now, really, what happened here, of course, was that we looked at the attributes surrounding the particular object, George, to determine its meaning, that it is George. We were looking at the context of the situation. Bob doesn't use the word context, but this is really what it's all about. So I think what you're finding is that a number of people are <coughs> driving in that same direction where context will become much more important, both not only for authorization, but also for authentication and for a lot of the other things that we're doing too, because this is just as useful when we're talking about governance, uh, whether it's identity governance or data governance or, or so on. I mean, Elle in her presentation really showed us a lot of work around not people but things, uh, which are very important when we're looking at that context and we're talking about data governance. I think that covers it. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Um, now a question for Elle. Um, you mentioned a possible use for a context server um, in the telecommunications industry. Can you give an example of other industries where Radiance Context Server could be used and how? Um, well, we, we do already use this technology for smarter authorization policies, for example. Um, but I do think that just the ability to tie together information across multiple application and data silos, it's been an ongoing question in the software industry for years. Um, but as far as markets go, industries such as retail, um, maybe distribution, healthcare, um, and also military accounts maybe could benefit. Um, plus, not to mention, context aware technology has been quite a buzzword right now, especially with the wide adoption of GPS-enabled smartphones. Um, but I do feel like with the additional complexity of location and mobility and everything, context aware services could really be a big deal. So. Um, but also, that's part of what this webinar is about. I'd really love to get input from our listeners, you know, as to use cases they might be interested in using context for, and we can, of course, explore that with them. Okay. Thank you, Elle. Um, let's see. One more question. How is Radiance Context Browser different from any CRM application that gives you a complete view of a user or customer? Well, a CRM application will always be more focused and targeted um, of a tool than our context browser. Um, but the problem is that even the best CRM solution needs to be able to communicate with other applications. So 
I mean, a CRM solution by itself is still just a data silo that stores information about customers. So if you either want more information about your customers or you want to add additional information, maybe like employee information or other data that's stored in a database or some other system, then you would need Context Browser. Uh, the main value of Context Browser is that it allows you to search information from across different kinds of data domains. Plus, as I mentioned, there are several use cases outside of customer relations management. So, Okay, well, thank you everyone. That's all we have time for today. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, Elle. We will be sending you a link to the slides and recording from today's session, and any questions we didn't have time to get to, we'll answer directly via email. Thanks again to Dave Kearns of Copinger Cole and to Elle Griffin from Radiant, and a very special thanks to all of you for joining us. Have a great day. Thanks so much, and I also want to encourage you guys to continue the conversation about context by visiting our Facebook page or catching us on Twitter. Um, there's definitely many use cases for context, and we'd love to hear how you would, would like to use it. So thanks for joining us.